Goranga, hey Goranga, hey Krishna, hey Krishna, 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 Hare Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram, Hare greatness is also his sweetness. If you know a person who's rich, famous, uh, intelligent, uh, well, those are the main things, but they're not kind. <laughs> they may have so many things that are what we say popular to have in this world, like wealth, prestige, good position, ability to do things, but they're not kind. Everything is lost, right? Who cares? But if a person is kind by nature, and they show that kindness, even if they don't have so much, 
they're lovable, they're desirable, their association is nice. Krishna is very kind. Krishna is very kind. And he, he doesn't have to be, but he is. <laughs> He's very kind. Although he has everything, and everybody worships him, still he's kind. <laughs> he's not proud that I'm God and therefore I'm, I'm the best and everybody has to kind of like, you know, realize it. <laughs> he becomes, and God just shows his kindness by becoming the servant of his devotee. When, when Lord Chaitanya was... Uh, traveling in South India, came to Sri Rangam Temple. And there was one Brahmana there. And this Brahmana was illiterate, he couldn't, couldn't uh, read or write. And his spiritual master told him, every day you must read the entire Bhagavad Gita. He couldn't read or write. The spiritual master knew that too, and told him. But being a dutiful disciple, he was like trying to read, but he couldn't. <laughs> he was holding the book upside down sometimes. So he didn't even know which way the pages were. <laughs> and his friends who knew that he was illiterate, they said they wouldn't make fun of him. Oh, what are you doing, Brahman? <laughs> and uh, he wouldn't answer them because he knew they were always joking with him. Well, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came and he saw this Brahmana and he said, Oh, Brahmana, what are you doing? But he could understand this person is not joking with me. So he said, well, I'm reading Bhagavad Gita, but I'm illiterate. But this was the instructions of my spiritual master. So I'm, I'm trying to read. But Lord Chaitanya said, I can see you're, you're crying. Why is that if you can't read? He said, well, actually, when I see this picture, and then he showed the picture of Krishna driving the chariot for Arjuna. He said, when I see this, I think, oh, this is God, and he becomes his servant of his devotee. I just, my heart just melts, and I feel like crying. And Lord Chaitanya said, you have understood Gita. <laughs> and he wasn't just making him feel good, he understood. You understand Krishna. Krishna becomes, Krishna likes to serve his devotees. And therefore, Prabhupada, you would say, there's always a competition between Krishna and his devotees. Who can serve more? <laughs> the devotee tries to serve the Lord, and the Lord tries to serve the devotee. And guess who wins? Krishna. <laughs> he always wins. <laughs> he serves better than we can serve him. <laughs> now, this, is the, this is the mercy and kindness of the Lord. So even though he's full of opulences, wealth, prestige, power, so many things. He's still very kind. <laughs> that's why that's what makes him so lovable. <laughs> and he, he he tells you what to do and then you do it and you get the credit. That's Krishna. <laughs> and Prabhupada makes the point in one purport in the Bhagavatam where the, he wants his temple built, and so he appears into a dream of someone and says, build my temple. And the devotee gets inspired by the dream, and then the Lord directs him on how to do it through his life. The temple's built, he becomes famous for building the temple of the Lord, but the Lord did everything. He gets all the credit. So we do things, and we achieve things, and actually, but it's the Lord that's doing everything behind the scenes. You can't see the hand of the Lord. But we, but we know it happens like that. Because Krishna said, I am knowledge, I am forgetfulness, I am memory also. Memory, knowledge, and forgetfulness. If you want to remember something, remember Krishna and you'll remember it. If you want to forget something, Krishna will give you all the re all the, the logic how to forget it. Just like Prabhupada would say, where do the atheist get all their good arguments for becoming an atheist? From Krishna. He, he supplies the intelligence for them to become an atheist. Because <laughs> that's what they want, so he fulfills their desire. 
There was one famous atheist in America many years ago, back in the 1930s, I think. Uh, I can't remember his name. But he was, he was a public atheist, and he would go out in public and say, and he would speak, and then he would stop his lecture, and he said, if there is a God, I challenge him to kill me right now. And then he would stop his lecture, and he said, I'll give him five minutes. <laughs> And so he'd stop his lecture, and then after five minutes, he would say, See, this proves there's no God. <laughs> but then Krishna killed him later. <laughs> Not according to his plan, <laughs> according to Krishna's plan. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's Krishna. Yeah. So, behind the scenes is the Supreme Lord, he does everything. So we're supposed to give a class to that now? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Is this the verse 811? Okay, so we're moving. We're already halfway through the class, so we'll just, I'll read the Sanskrit. Yad aksaram veda vido vadanti vishanti tadva yata vishanti yad yata yo vita ragaha Yad itchito brahmacharyam charanti tate padam sangrahenena pravakshe. Pravakshe. Persons who are learned in the Vedas, who utter omkar, and who are great sages in the renounced order, enter into Brahman. Desiring such perfection, one practices celibacy. I shall now briefly explain to you this process by which one can attain salvation. Purport. Lord Sri Krishna has recommended to Arjuna the practice of Satkriya Yoga, in which one places the air of life between the eyebrows. Taking it for granted that Arjuna might not know how to practice Satchakra Yoga, the Lord explains the process in the following verses. The Lord says that Brahman, although one without a second, has various manifestations and features. See, this is where the Mayavadis say. They say Brahman is one without a second, but they don't accept manifestations and features of Brahman. They think Brahman is one and that's it. But we say, well, there's the gold and there's the gold mine. So the gold mine has a lot of gold, but then there's the gold earring, the gold ring, they're all gold. So the quality is the same, the quantity is different. So there's varieties of Brahman expressions, the Mayavadis say no. Especially for the impersonalist, the Aksara or Omkara, the syllable Om, is identical with Brahman. Krishna here explains the impersonal Brahman in which the renounced order of sages answer. In the Vedic system of knowledge, students from the very beginning are taught to vibrate Om and learn the ultimate impersonal Brahman by living with the spiritual master in complete celibacy. In this way, they realize two of Brahman's features. This practice is very essential for those students advancing in spiritual life, but at the moment such brahmacharis, unmarried celibate life, is not at all possible. The social construction of the world has changed so much that there is no possible ability of practicing celibacy from the beginning of student life. Throughout the world there are many institutions for different departments of knowledge, but there is no recognized institution where students can be educated in brahmachari principles. Unless one practices celibacy, advancement in spiritual life is very difficult. Therefore, Lord Chaitanya has announced, according to the scriptural injunctions, injunctions for this age, that in this age no process of realizing the Supreme is possible except for chanting of the holy names of the Lord. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Om Ajnana Timirandasya Ginajana Salakaya Chaksun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaham Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai So, okay. 
here, I don't know. <clears throat> this is talking about the two preliminary aspects of the Absolute Truth. Vadanti tat tat vad vidyam, tat vyajam jnanam avyayam, brahmeti paramatmeti, bhagavaneti sabjate. The Absolute Truth is made up of three aspects of itself. It's one, but it's understood in three, from three angles of vision. Just like, I'll give you an example. You're looking at a mountain from a distance. And what do you see? Sometimes it looks like a, just like a, a cloud in the sky. But when you come close to the mountain, you can see that there, it's a mountain and it has greenery around it. But then if you go on the mountain, you'll see that there are people and animals living there. So from different three angles of vision, you're seeing the same mountain. So from the far distance, that's Brahman. From the closer distance, that's Paramatma. And from the uh, being on the mountain, that is Bhagavan realization. So it's the same mountain from three angles. So in the same way, uh, the Absolute Truth is recognized in three features. So here they're talking about the Brahman feature, and also Krishna mentions the second stage, the Paramatma, which is a localized feature. Vidya Vidya Vinaya Sampane, Brahmani Gavihastini, Suni Chaiva Saparke Cha, Pandita Savadarshanaha. So one who has spiritual vision sees all living entities as part and parcel of Krishna. In other words, they see Krishna in the heart of all living entities. Not only do they see Krishna, but they see also within that heart there is the soul and the super soul, two aspects. They may not see it through what is called material vision, but they see it through material intelli spiritual intelligence. And they actually understand that all life is God, and God manifests himself in, in two features in this world, as himself, in the form of the holy name, and as the living entity, the jiva soul. So the jiva soul exists in, everywhere in this material energy, and that is called life in this world. But the third and highest and most complete realization of God is his Bhagavan feature, or his feature as personality. Because the Brahman feature gives you the understanding that you are eternal and that this material world is temporary. Like that. That's the Brahman feature, that you are different from everything material and everything in this world is simply temporary. It's moving in different ways. And so that that is done by the jnanis, or those who are... The jnanis, they have partial knowledge, but not complete knowledge. The yogis, they have more complete knowledge. They see that in the heart of all living entities, that God is there. And therefore, they realize then that God is with God is localized also, although He's all pervading in His Brahman feature too. So, in that localized feature, they realize uh, the yogis through austerities, drilling the respiration, which means the pranayama process, like that, they can realize that that, that all living entities are spiritual by nature. But the devotees, they have this special feature, and which is the feature of the complete uh, success of the soul's connection with the Absolute Truth, and that is the, the, uh, the Bhagavan feature. Because the highest principle, or the most sought-after principle, is the principle of love. And the, the yogis and the jnanis, they can't really reach the stage of love, because love means person. So because they can't love the Absolute Truth because they don't have the uh, personal understanding of the Absolute Truth, they, they fall down into the material energy and, and try to love something material. Or they try to love all mankind by doing welfare work for people in different types of social and uh, philanthropical organizations like hospitals and self-help organizations or whatever are out there in today's world. What's so funny? 
you guys are having a nice class, huh? <laughs> Maybe, I don't mind, but you must be, it must be interesting, huh? Is it something special, private, or no? Is it private? <laughs> okay, if you're waiting for me to tell jokes, <laughs> you're not going to get it tonight. <laughs> But if you want, I will. <laughs> I'll end with a joke at the end. Anyway. But for now, this is a very interesting verse because it really helps us understand why we worship why, the way we worship. Because the highest principle of, of worship is to experience love. And from the first two stages of uh, God realization, the loving principle is absent because personality is not focused. So when you know that God is a person and he has qualities and attributes, and then the process is to connect with him in devotion and develop a loving relationship. And that's the complete fulfillment of the, the soul's uh, need. Because unless you experience love, life is not complete. People who don't love or don't, don't give love or don't, receive love, they're miserable. They try to love something else. Sometimes they love their dog, or their computer, their car, their money, their own ideas. They develop a kind of attraction and affection for these things. But real love is actually from person to person. As Prabhupada says, you can't love an animal, because the animal can't reciprocate that kind of loving relationship. So love has to be between humans, but in that human exchange of love, it always falls short of perfection because there's so many problems on the material level with relationships. So therefore the perfect and complete uh, uh, attainment of love is to, to, for the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And when love resides there, or awakens there, then one can love everything and everyone else automatically because everyone and everyone is seen to be connected to the Lord because the Lord is not separate from anything. Although the separateness looks like that, but once that loving relationship comes, then that love expands out because everything in one sense is the Lord also. So loving the Lord as a person means loving those aspects that are Him in His energies also, like that. Just like there's a class of spiritualists that they love the earth so much that they worship the earth and everything about the earth. They won't do it. They won't throw any trash on the earth. They won't spit on the earth. They won't do anything. They see the earth as being worshipable. And they see it almost as God itself, but actually that there there is there is a connection, because actually the earth is the creation of God and works under the care of God, and is and is one of the principles energies of God. So by loving the earth, they have some understanding of the principle of that it's somehow or other. Uh, worshipable, because it is, in the sense that it's the energy of the Lord, a very important energy of the Lord. So i just using that example to say that as you love Krishna, you love everybody else. <laughs> All other living entities become part of that experience. So here, but here, Prabhupada ends the purport. Beyond all these different yoga uh, activities of controlling the mind and the senses and drilling the respiration, practicing various types of uh, austerities. And Prabhupada says, Chan, Chan Hare Krishna. <laughs> Chan Hare Krishna. <laughs> and he ends there, he says, in this age, all these other processes are not possible. Therefore, Lord Chaitanya is giving us the supreme and very direct process. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. 
Hare Ram, Hare Ram, 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 Hare. Anybody can do it, but to do it in such a way that we get the benefit means to work at it, to develop it. And therefore, service has to be connected also. If you chant and you don't serve, your chanting won't go beyond a certain stage. Because um, bhakti can, can, consists of two things, the sadhya and the seva. And the seva is the service and the sadhya, not sadhya, but sadhana and sadhya. Sadhana and seva. Sadhya is the gold. And so these two things, it's like a coin. A coin has two sides, heads and tails. So in the same way, bhakti means to worship the Lord by ch chanting His holy name and using your energy to serve the Lord in devotion. And as the service increases, the quality of cred, as the quality of our service increases, the quality of our chanting also will increase like that. And vice versa, as the quality of your chanting increases, your automatically your service will increase like that. So they work like that. There are people I know who chant Hare Krishna. They've been chanting for 25, 30 years, but they don't do any service. So they don't, they, they chant, and what are they getting from the chanting? They're getting some protection from the material energy, but they're not getting love of God. They're not getting... Uh, what we say, any higher knowledge of their relationship with Krishna. Because they're missing the whole point. As Srila Prabhupada said, when you're chanting Hare Krishna, what are you doing? You're asking Krishna for service. <laughs> My dear Lord, how can I serve you? So by asking the, Krishna for service through the process of chanting the holy name, Krishna will provide that opportunity which in cause, causes you to develop more and more of a taste for chanting Hare Krishna, like that. So, and there's people who, there are devotees who like to serve more than they chant and there's others who like to chant more than they serve. But either way, there should be both within the, like that. But when you come to the highest platform, then you can just chant then that becomes your service. But you can't artificially go to that platform automatically and say, oh, I'm just going to chant. <laughs> no, you have to actually go through the process of purification through chanting and through seva. Seva takes you away from the idea that you're the center or makes Krishna the center or makes the spiritual master the center and gives you the understanding that you are actually a servant. And your main uh, occupation is to serve. And when you find happiness or find fulfillment in your service, then you can understand, yeah, oh yes, this is my relationship through service. So through service and through chanting, these two things. Okay, so these are some simple principles. Any questions? Comments, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is your name again? Jagannath Sutta Das. Huh? Jagannath Sutta. Jagannath Sutta? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Nice name. Um, so, as you mentioned at the beginning, mm, the exchanges of love are possible only between. Humans. The same species. Yeah, yeah right. Mm. So, but between God and the soul. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in this material world. So, yeah. um, what about when people say, like, I mean, everybody knows that, as you said, that many times we fall short in these exchanges. Um, but my question is, what about um, when people say, like, oh, I have this uh, fish, they love me so much, or my dog really understands my feelings or like that. So what is that um, connection that they have? Like, Well, if you, if the dog is looking for a good master because without getting a master, the dog is miserable. <laughs> Prabhupada talks about street dogs. They're just wandering here and there. But when they get a good master, then they feel happy. They bark just to make the master happy. And they, they chase away people 
Because <laughs> when they, people come close. So a dog is very territorial, like that. And different, so you might say a fish or a dog or any animal. Animals also have feelings, but they can't, they can't reciprocate loving feelings with uh, people, with, with other species. It's just, it's just a whole different consciousness. An animal can have affection for its cubs, and like a lion will have affection for her, like that. Like that, but generally it's, it's not... That's mentioned in the Bhagavatam, that's why I'm saying it. And Prabhupada said love is only between people, uh, but between uh, spe those of the same species, like that. So a dog might come and have some affection for his master, but what is that affection? He's going to get something to eat. He wants... Uh, they sometimes they say when a dog comes up to you and starts smelling you, he's thinking, "What does this guy taste like?" You know. <laughs> sometimes they say that. <laughs> so we don't really know the consciousness of an animal, but love, even as it's defined, is not just a feeling. Love is actually a principle of relationship where one sees the benefit of others as their main goal in life. How can I make you happy? That's love. Now, now what, what can I do for you that will make me happy? That's not love. <laughs> that's, that's more like merchandise. You go to the store, you pay your money, and then you get some product in return. You don't have a loving relationship with the, the storekeeper. So in the same way, love is not about getting something, it's about giving something. But because love is such a powerful emotion that giving is getting. In other words, those who love are happy. <laughs> because love itself is satisfying. <laughs> so it has to be between similar species like that. But when we speak about our relationship with God, it's from soul to soul, you know, because we are of the same quality of Krishna spiritually. Yeah, I, w I, I remember reading it in the Bhagavatam, but I'm not sure exactly what canto that's in. It's been a long time since I read it. Does that help? Thank you. Any other questions? Danilu, you have one? No. Be careful how much, how high you put your arms up. <laughs> no more questions? Okay, so. So I promised you a joke, right? <laughs> Which one should I tell? I don't know if this is a joke, but it's actually a true story. I think I told this one already. Maybe you heard it. One new boy, he joined the Hare Krishna movement, so they put him out on Sankirtan. He didn't know much about the movement, so he's distributing books. And so he gives one person a book, and the bomb man is looking, and he turns over on the back, he sees Prabhupada's picture, and he reads the name, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. So he turns to the book distributor, and what does A.C. mean? And he didn't really know, so he said, Always cool. <laughs> and the man, of course, accepted it. He didn't know. <laughs> if I was in London, I could tell you a good joke that you'd like, but maybe because you're not Londonites, you might not get it. But prove a 
but our Bengali friend in the back there, he'll get it. So I'll tell you one more. So one Indian man, he's walking across the street, and he he collapses in the middle of the road. People gather around. He obviously had a stroke. He's still conscious, but he's suffering. So everyone comes around to help him, and the police are there, and the police, and the man is saying, get me a Hindu priest, get me a Hindu priest, get me a Hindu priest. So the police officer looks at the crowd, any Hindu priest there? Nobody. So one Jewish man, he says, I'm not, a, I, you know, I'm not a Hindu priest, but I live next door to a Hare Krishna temple and I know all their prayers. <laughs> so he said, all right, you'll do. <laughs> so go ahead and give him the prayer. So he gets down next to him and he says, uh, yeah, we want to thank Mr. Patel for his contribution to sponsoring the Sunday feast. <laughs> <laughs> you go to London or America, it's it's the main mantra. <laughs> <laughs> There's a gathering of Indians in the temple one time, and so the person gets on and says, excuse me, but we have one problem. There's a car that's blocking all the cars, and it belongs to Mr. Patel. So could Mr. Patel move his car? And so the, all the, the, whole, the whole congregation leaves. <laughs> Everybody's named Mr. Patel. <laughs> Such is life. <laughs> okay. These are all the these are all the civilized jokes. The these the other ones I don't tell in public. <laughs> okay. So is there one more good one? Can I tell a Chinese joke? Anybody here favorable to the Chinese? All right, I'll tell the Chinese. So if you don't have any, if you, if you like Chinese too much, you might not like this joke. Anyway, so how do the Chinese uh, perform a name-giving ceremony? You know that one, okay. So they take a pot and they throw it up in the air, and when it hits, it goes bong, wong. <laughs> Jing, ting, <laughs> ling. <laughs> Chinese name giving ceremony. <laughs> you knew that one, right? Actually, I knew the version. We take the empty metal pot and they bang it. Yeah, and they bang it. And they bang it. And you roll it down the stairs. Yeah, Okay. Anyway, I won't be so popular with the Chinese anyway. <laughs> okay, but uh, if I start telling jokes, you know, I go on for two hours, so I better, it's not so healthy. <laughs> so we'll have to stop here. But there, Krishna has a funny joke. We were out preaching one time, and uh, we were going to different places. And we were going to these different radio stations and TV stations, and we were doing interviews. Cause... And the, the guy who was taking us around, he was just like a reporter. So he said, he said, oh, you guys are the Hare Krishnas. And we said, no, we're the Hare Krishnas. Hairy Krishnas, because at that time we were we were growing our hair out. And we had a whole different thing. So we said we were Hairy Krishnas. So the whole time we were with the, the, this reporter, we were, everybody was real serious and sober. So when we said that, he said, "Oh, you guys got a sense of humor." <laughs> 
And so one of our devotees said, yeah, so does Krishna, just look in the mirror. <laughs> Krishna has a sense of humor. Here, here's, here are you. Here you are. <laughs> it's not you. You think it is. That's the joke. <laughs> okay, so, so much for tonight's version. Continue tomorrow. I'll tell some blonde jokes later on, but that's not, that's not good. <laughs> So thank you very much, <laughs> and uh, don't forget Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. Srila <laughs> Prabhupada ki jai.